And um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's been a very warm welcome this afternoon to Chester Castle on this uh, Armistice Day. This is our first offering in representing the, the Great War here at Chester. And that uh, hopefully I can see you've been mightily busy talking to our fine set of interpreters that we've got here. Um, all volunteers, I might add, ourselves, so all these gentlemen and ladies that you've seen today are all part of our team of volunteers within English Heritage but within their own right, experts in, in, in their own field in this, in this particular offering of the Great, the Great War. So why the Great War here? Chester, when the war breaks out in 1914, Lord Kitchener gives the cry of wanting 150,000 men to boost the British Army. The British Army is incredibly small, but very, very professional. Within a month, he doesn't get 150, he gets a million, he gets a million men. And Chester Castle is the epicentre of this part of the northwest of England for enlistment. This particular courtyard and this building behind you, you see here, Napier House, which was built in 1830. Mm -hmm. The whole complex of the castle is very firmly suited with the military. This is the regimental depot of the Cheshire Regiment. Now, upwards of 40 plus thousand men from 1914 through to 90, the end of 1915 come through this castle. If any of you are Cheshire people, if you've got relatives who were served in the Cheshire's in the Great War, there is a great high possibility your relative walked through those gates there, came in, attested, i.e. swore to the colours here, and was medically examined, given his papers, and then told to report to his battalion at a different time. Such was the call that Cheshire men gave at the beginning of 1914 that the Cheshire Regiment raised its battalions upwards of 40 plus battalions serving both in the Western Front, in Eastern Theatres, Salonica, the Gallipoli Campaign and Dardanelles and such as, but particularly the Western Front we associate the Tommy with. Now again, the gentleman here that you've been speaking to and our civilian detachment, we've been trying to debunk some myths as well about the First World War, about this, this nonsense of lion, lions led by donkeys. It's, the, the, it's a post-modernistic view. It is speaking, speaking to individual the veterans that we spoke to some years ago always said about the pride that they had and that they didn't consider it's the, uh, what they did, it, it was their duty. And what you must remember, ladies and gentlemen, is that this is England, Britain's a different society. All these men, if they were real First World War soldiers, they are born Victorians. So they are clearly and simply being brought up in a world where Britain and yes, I'm going to say the E word, empire, is that there is absolutely a must. It's given that you're British and therefore you're the best. It's the best. So it's installed then different societies, different frames of minds as we are today. But a lot of people have to must bear this in mind in the mindset of Tommy, of the British Tommy. So the war breaks out, it's the, uh, England, Britain is not in a war footing in terms of manufacturing, it's struggling. All these men, tens of thousands of men all over enlisted, no, no equipment, no uniform. So it takes a long time for the war's footing to gain momentum in, in, in Britain. I'm going to start with these two gentlemen here on the very end, the Corporal and this Private. They represent the regular... British Army, the British Expeditionary Force. Britain has always had a small but in highly professional army. So it was the BEF, or as the Kaiser called them, the Old Contemptibles. It's the uh, who met the German might at the outside of the Belgian town of Mons. It's the um, and were the first battalion of the Cheshire Regiment held in, on, on its own, 700 men. In, or thereabouts, holding it in one particular action in Belgium, an entire German division of 22,000. Now, that's all to do, as you will see later on, about the firepower and the training of the British soldier. They both wear the general service dress and cap, the, 
the infamous putties, indeed, as around the legs, as all the men do, and they have the latest 08 pattern webbing. Now, this, from a military point of view, is a piece of kit, is actually way ahead of its time. It gives the carriage of ammunition of 303 rounds in charger clips of five, which then well equips the, the individual soldier, and of course, his fame, SMLE, you just see, see there. They both wear, obviously, their knapsacks, or in this case, it's corporal. It's a, they are both in what we call FSMO, Field Service Marching Order. They have the large pack and then the haversack just here, containing great coat, ground sheet, all the necessaries, rations of food and, and supply, training tools and bayonet. You can see on their left hand side. And then at this point there is no <coughs> gas in 1914. That's worthy. We'll come on to that in, in a minute. Thank you, gentlemen. We're going to tip a hat and we must, it's only fair to do so. Britain did not fight alone. We said we had an empire, we had Commonwealth troops. So there are tens of thousands of troops that fought for Britain in the First World War. Our individual here is dressed as the 21st Battalion of the Australian Infantry. So Australia, New Zealand, all the Commonwealth denominations, tens of thousands of Indian soldiers on the Western Front as well. It's never all equally took their share, South African contingents and such like, all rallied to the colours and the war broke out. So again, our Australian colleague here, we'll speak to him later on, slightly different shade of, of khaki, but denoted by the, the Australian bush hat there, but the equipment is pretty much exactly the same. Now moving along the side here, this young chap here, he wears the 1902 equipment, now, when the war breaks out, it's that, as I say, we're short of kit and equipment. So old stock is starting to be given out. You'll notice the bandolier here, and he, his rifle is slightly different. This is called the Long Lee, the Long Lee Enfield. And look, this has been short, the Enfield. And you'll see the plate. So his kit and equipment reflects that earlier time that's still being used at the start of the war. The next man along, just there, he's a, he's a territorial. So territorial, we're going to call up. He's denoted by, you'll notice, on the majority of our shoulder clapping people that we're back, and the majority of the Cheshire Regiment. <coughs> he has a team of territorial, and again, exactly the same, the 08 Webby, and supply. The next man along, so we're moving along the timeline a bit now, he'll start to come into. From 15 to 1916. <coughs> this man is from the 8th Battalion, the Harvard Battalion, the Manchester Regiment. Again, a huge regiment of up to 22 battalions. It's in a, and by the time we get a little bit further into the war, we get a mix of men. So if you were wounded, came back to England, you might be sent into an entirely different regiment. So you may have started in the Sheffield, but you may have ended up in the Manchester as an example. And you see the difference there. He wears the eight on his, on his shoulder sleeve just there. The Manchester and the cap bag that the Manchester. He's also got a wire cutter just on there to combat if they're doing a wire. You can just see there, which is again the ingenious device rather than having to pull on the side and say bolt cutting or, or wire cutting. And again, he's equipped and armed exactly like the standard troops that we've seen thus far. We're moving to the winter of 1516, and this man that you can see here, he's very different now. Again, he's got on his ground there, he's supplementing the winter in the trenches. And here's another difficulty you must say they didn't spend four years in the trenches all the time. Soldiers were involved round. You cannot keep men in those conditions for long periods of time. So, a couple of weeks maximum, maximum is <coughs> what they kept in the revolt. The British soldiers always in history found a way of keeping themselves warm. So supplemented with a sheepskin or goatskin fleece there to keep them warm. He's got gloves upon his head. There he's got this shapeless cap, which the Tommies call the gore blimey. It's the uh, it buttons down, it goes down further and wraps around the face just there. 
which he'll demonstrate just there. So this is much more practical than perhaps the service cap that you would see. It's got a back edge just there, and that's going to keep you nice and toasty warm uh, of a night inside the trench, ginger just there. Moving on, again, we're starting in 1915. Gas was introduced. Now, if you come back later on over here, 